Hello and welcome to the Secrets of Healthful Motherhood Summit. My name is Vera Stupina and I'm your host for the next 10 days or so. Today I'm really excited to introduce you to yet another guest on my summit. Her name is Abby Bordner. Abby Bordner is a consultant and speaker for parents and professionals serving families. And she developed a relationship-based parenting for multiple areas of study, which is science, psychology, communication, and development. And her work is focused on building healthy relationships within the family to create respect, compassion, and joy. And um, Abby has been blogging for a couple of different sites, and um, okay, I'm good. she's so been much. an expert on a few different other summits before. And I'm very excited to have her here with us today. Um, hi, Abby. How are you? Thank you so much for making time and agreeing to do the interview with us. Uh, so first, just to start, can you sure, tell us a little bit sure, about well, yourself, I your story, why you started you early on after college, I started working in mental health and eventually and became a pregnancy educator over the years. And then I had my two kids, uh, and I feel like my career has kind of followed my personal life in the sense that the years I was pregnant with my kids and then four years between, I was teaching chapter classes and working as a doula and labor assistant. And then once my kids started um, growing up, I started having more parenting information and my own curiosity personally. Um, I guess I'm one of those people that learns when I teach. So I started teaching and getting together groups of parents and went on to study and get several certificates in parenting curriculum and uh, the brain science around relationships in early childhood is fascinating to me and I've been really fortunate in the last eight or nine years to continually be studying um, the psychology of the childhood, the importance of relationships and how kids develop emotional resiliency in the relationship with parents. So um, about three years ago I put together a material that I call relationship-based parenting and it's a combination of really good science and psychology information about what it takes to raise healthy successful kids and there's a lot of studies now that show that there are certain things you can focus on as a parent in early childhood and during your time with your children that really have impact for the rest of their life. That kids who get security and um, emotional resiliency skills or get good self-confidence in childhood, they end up being leaders of companies and uh, very successful in their profession, but also emotionally healthy. They have a good relationships. They feel good about themselves. And um, so I really just want to teach parents what I've learned. And if you focus on a few of these key places in childhood, you have the biggest impact overall for your children. I have a 15 and a half year old. My son's going to get his driver's license next week. So <laughs> I'm doing, I'm doing oh, that to the teen parenting, or parenting teenagers now. And my daughter's 11 and she's in the grade. Uh, and so they're, they're a little bit older now and I really am enjoying this phase of parenting. I always thought parenting teenagers could be the worst part of parenting. And so far so good. My, my son's a good kid and I still really feel uh, involved in his life in a positive way. And so that's kind of what I hoped for. There were times when my kids were little and I thought, you know, I don't want my kids to be scared of me or worry that if they get caught that I'm going to alienate them or push them away because now that I have teenagers, I want them to know they can come to me. And it's been really important. That's kind of what drives my parenting in the sense that I want them to like me enough that they'll come to me even when they have a choice and they would, would rather be with their friends. But my kids, uh, they still seem to confide in me and, and respect me, which I feel really grateful for. Right, right. So a lot of my work in the last six years uh, um, in town has been learning about the process of the early childhood. So I have a lot of expertise in the zero to five-year-old range, but then it's been very easy to continue that into the older children ages because a lot of it is very consistent. What do you think, what would you say was the hardest um, you know, of um, I think your the hardest kids, when like, they were both under the age. And my kids are four part? years apart, so I had a baby and a four-year-old, and I think Maybe for three years there with my youngest and my younger two, I had I struggled. I struggled with managing uh, a, a four, five, six year old as well as a newborn baby. And and looking back, I feel like I also was suffering from depression because I was overwhelmed and unhappy some of the time. And so I really have focused with some of my clients on this idea of um, emotional health for mom and what it look like. And that's why I was so interested in participating in your summit because there's such a natural overlap of if mom is healthy and whole everyone benefits. So, but I think we're the first people to say, oh, you know, self-care, I'll just put that on the bottom of the list and get to it in five years. Um, and I really suffered because I didn't make that a priority for myself. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the reason I'm asking you this is because so my kids are all the same age friends. They're three and a half years apart. When I had a baby, the other one was three and a half, which I thought was mm -hmm. going to be a little easier, you know, in some ways. He was the potty drink, you could jump with a snack or watch TV, you know, give me some time with the baby, which of course it was. But then uh, he was also starting to develop some his own opinion, and he didn't always agree with me. And then suddenly from it's really hard to do it or understand his feelings or what he's going through. So, uh, you know, we always talk about the terrible twos, but then they become three and it becomes even harder. Then they become four and then it gets even harder than that. So how do you, how do you, what would be your advice for somebody you know, who is having a hard time mm -hmm. to adjust for their children? Well, the things that happen, I mean, especially in the two five old range, um, the biggest task of parenthood during that time is helping kids manage their emotions. And so I think people do say terrible twos because 
toddlers will have these outbursts of emotions, but that doesn't stop when they turn three. Like you said, you have to later on, they're a little bit more mature, but they also have a deeper sense of their emotional experience in school and with you. And so sometimes those, those ups and downs can be even bigger in three and four. And um, so as parents, it's really important to start getting into what happened to your kid emotionally. It may be that he's saying, no, I want to go to bed right now. But you can think a little bit beyond what, the, what he's saying and go, oh, he doesn't want to be separated from me, he's having a hard time uh, calming down. This is scary for him. All parents have sleep issues. Most people will say that transition from being awake and active to laying there and relaxing and finally falling asleep is a hard for kids to do. Dinner, but, you know, extreme lengths to get comfortable and safe and happy for their kids. Um, but don't worry, that'll get better. My, my 15-year-old goes and my 11-year-old goes better. <laughs> no. no, yeah, it did get better. But, um, so I was more encouraging you to consider, can I meet their needs emotionally? And that is just a way to think a little bit better than what your child's opinion is. And certainly I'm having some conversations situations where they think differently than you or their opinion is different and you have to be able to tolerate that on some level but it's helpful to give them choices i'm sure you've heard in parenting advice that at any moment if you can say would you like this or this and you as a parent feel fine about your one that they might choose you don't want to say you want to take that or not because they really need to take that but you could say do you want bubbles or no bubbles and that means giving them a sense of oh i'm controlling my environment here and that's satisfying to them because when they have tantrums or their emotions are really intense they're out of control they don't like it as much as you don't like it you know that's hard for sometimes parents start to feel angry at their kids or impatient or stressed out by the big emotions and the best we can do as parents is figure out how do i calm myself down so that i help him calm down because our kids really do need this co-regulation where you come into your lap and hold them and they stream a little bit deeper and they run to you and get scared or they're hurt because the minute they're with you they ability to co-regulate which means your calm state can help them calm down but if a kid's having a tantrum and then you're starting to get escalated and angry and you're up here and having kind of tantrum of your own you have to first be able to calm yourself down. It doesn't mean like you have to pretend that you're happy and everything's fine. It just means like walk down to the end of the hall and turn around, turn around and come back or take a drink of water or um, count to 10. You know, simple, you just do it. Instead of being like, I'm, I'm so mad at you, you're just like, okay, we got it, we got it, we got it. Now I'm going to help you get in bed. I'm going to hold your hand as you fall asleep. Or you just kind of take control of this situation, and that's so comforting for kids. So it's kind of the same way when we talk about like children and kids don't even that's exactly what right. 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 a lot of times when I work with parents, I, 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 I talk about wanting their kids to be able to manage our emotions. That's a really helpful thing for us to do. But first we have to start with how do I manage my own emotions? And it's okay that we get angry and that we get impatient. It's not like we're supposed to pretend that we always are happy and fine, but you have to be there. You have to tune in to yourself. You have to be willing to track your own experience at the same time you're tracking the attachment you're building with your child. So if you're really pissed off, you don't have to pretend that you're not. You do have to get yourself like under control by taking some deep breaths and really working to get yourself a calm state. So can I teach them that it's okay to be sad, it's okay to be angry or frustrated, but you know, at the same time, not just say show them how the way that you think your child is feeling. Try to try not to say it's okay that you're feeling or I know that you're feeling, but just say you're angry. This is really hard for you, or, or you, just, you don't want to go to bed. It's hard to go to bed. When you say in a neutral way what you think they're experiencing, it's very comforting for kids. Or if your child's having a tantrum, you just say you're so angry, and you're, you're screaming, you're just you're so upset that when you say it like that with compassion, I see what's going on for you. You don't have to change your mind. You don't have to, um, you know, tiptoe on their feelings. You can just say, that's what's going on. And then they get this moment of going, take a breath and say, yeah, that's it, Mom. You get it. And oftentimes you can work them down by talking to them. Anyway, it's just a, 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 using language to help identify their experience. Children under seven years old are always in their emotional experience. So they don't need, like, front brain activity that says, oh, that would be unreasonable to try and fall asleep now. Or, you know, us adults are always up here and, like, what? Why are you doing this? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> they're really, like, driven by this physical experience or emotion. You know, it's exhausting. Honestly, there were times that I, if I cried and got excited as much as my kids do in a day, I would be so tired. <laughs> You know, they spend a lot of energy in that. So as parents, we have to kind of help them learn the words that describe it, how to talk about it, and the best way to do that is in a kind of compassionate way. And you may find if you try it with your children that they calm down even easier. And if you get things like go to your room and don't act this way and come out when you're ready. And because then you kind of, you could damage the connection with your child when you send away and you get angry and you yell. And then, you know, then feeling kind of regretful and like, oh, I had that differently. And your child kind of goes out and you have to get repair. You know, you have to go, okay, come here, let me give you a hug and, and pass that damage, you know, that happens. Well, it's never when you right. And sometimes they're scared of it because they rely so much on us to be their safe haven and their rounding place that um, when we lose control like that, sometimes, you know, you might catch your child looking at you like, oh my gosh, I'm scary. Um, so just take a deep breath and you just say to your kids, I'm sorry, I lost my temper, I yelled, you know, and that's what we do. And you want to raise me, um, sometimes after a long day of, as you said, being excited and then being sad and then going to play or like park or something else, they must be so tired, they are so exhausted, and they're so done with their time. And I always say, somebody please come with me down for an appreciate. Right, I, I know, parents want them, and kids, them. Them. kids get them, and we don't. <laughs> so, uh, I want to talk a little bit about respect and the other point. Uh, what's your approach to um, to a parent-child relationship? Who are you to your kids? Are you their friend? Are you their, Are you just the authority? Are you just like a like a leader that all have to listen to what you say? Mm-hmm. What do you, what do you recommend? Um, 
want to tell you a story that came to my mind. I watched an interview with John Bolt, and the interviewer was saying, um, tell me about your parents. What, what do you remember growing up, and who were your parents in life? And he said, you know, my parents were always number one fans. They always knew that I would be the best at what I wanted to do, and they encouraged me. And, and you know, I'm famous now and wealthy, very proud of me. But the truth is, when I was in fourth grade play, they were happy for me and proud of me, and they really believed in me. And when I went to college, they were so confident that I would need it and get my, my school schooling done. And when I was a you know, they just went out of the space and I thought, you know, that's really special because I would want my kids to say that about me. I would want my kids to feel like I was always their number one fan. And it was, for me, I think it's not like an either or, you know, just to be friendly or do I have to be the authority. It's almost all of it. You are all of it. It's different than just every, like, every relationship with another adult because there's also this leadership role that we take as parents and as leaders for kids. I like to use that concept of leadership instead of discipline or punishment or authority because when you think of like a leader of an organization or a country or a church or community, it's really someone who has confidence in the group, confidence in the, the people he or she leading. And they make decisions that are decisive and thoughtful, but not overly emotional. Um, they take your interest into consideration, but it may not be that that's the only thing that's important. And so I like to try to balance the scales for parents because I think they, they feel like I either have to be with a bad guy who inflicts punishment, or I can be a super cool mom that's friendly and that you snuggle up with and she never tells you what to do. Um, but really, there's a place in the middle where you can have all of that without it being out of balance. And then I've been guilty. I've been watching this show on um, whatever channel I don't remember. Darren who has been going on for, I don't know, several years. And it's funny to watch how there's a bunch children or kind of poor going on children with their own kids. And everybody has their own style of parenting. And every one of them, like there's a cool mom, like you said, you know, she's the best little kid. She never tells them, you know, what to do or what not to do. And it's kind of goes one way. Then it's always practical mm-hmm. in some other ways. And uh, how I was growing up, that was back in the Soviet Union, and my parents were really, really educated. And uh, they had, my mom was a doctor, my dad was working for the government company. And uh, they were never my friends. So they always wish for me and the, the, um, the way how they would teach me how to be successful in life. They were always saying, you have to study, you have to pick this, you cannot pick any routine, you have to go by this rule, you have to study real well. If you don't study, you're working uh, like a food or something like that. So there, there was always guilt, you know, and um, like, you know, my parents, and they did everything they could, and they were young too. So once they got older, I think they, my dad now says he wishes he could have changed something. I guess that's part of being a young parent that you don't always know how to do it. So I try not to do as much of it with my kids, but at the same time, it kind of helped me to grow up who I am to, you know, it can make me somebody who wants to finish what they started and uh, always try to be the best out of everybody. So I think it's really, it's really hard to choose. And do you think, like, do you usually base uh, your relationship advice on your intuition or on science or on psychology? Or it's like a combination of both? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a combination. I think what I really get from all those the studies, um, the study called the neurobiology of interpersonal relationships that really talks about the couple's brain and how a young brain early years is forming and uh, brain development evolves so that the this young brain can handle and manage over 200 interactions in a given day and that uh, children's brains really do form the most important neurological pathways in the context of leading to other people that feel safe and caring toward them. So that's, you know, proven brain science. And so taking that and then putting it into the context of the parent-child relationship and how to really maximize what we give our children for health and emotional resiliency and then the psychology of that sense of secure attachment, where you, uh, the, in the first months of a child's life, an attachment pattern is formed. And the definition of it, a very simple ability for the child to communicate and uh, get their needs met, and the ability for parents to respond and understand the cues. Because, of course, a baby is communicating with cues and instead of words. So, how tuned in does a parent, um, is a parent to the needs of the baby, and also how easily is it for a parent to separate, make a taste for them, for between them and the baby? So, that's the psychology of attachment. And I like to look at the um, middle ground where parents are we focusing on the emotional resiliency. And emotional resiliency is going to be more important than IQ in the long-term success of a child in their life. So even more than, you know, how many of them or how many degrees I'll get in college, this emotional intelligence says, I can understand my feelings, I can get out my feelings, I met my dad in a healthy way. And when you can do that, even if you're failing something or you're taking a risk or you are dealing with trouble in your life, that skill of emotional resiliency is what creates people that really strive, like you were saying, to do the best. And I think that becomes kind of an inherent quality of kids who get that secure attachment and, and optimal interaction. So I feel like there are times that I get to know my and my advice becomes intuitive because they're not always a black and white. I mean, every situation, it's like, well, you could try this, you could do that. And I don't need to have an answer to how to get your kid to behave or do something. But if you focus on the relationship in certain ways that I teach parents, then you really build a, a repertoire of uh, coping skills that will best serve your child. And you waste difficult kinds of parents and your kid really struggles in their lives, and you just kind of want to be able to manage that out, you know, going downhill with addiction or, you know, self-harm. And uh, I think what you said, you know, the emotional connections they form in their childhood, because uh, it was not common in Soviet Union, you know, and uh, I never really had a really deep emotional contact relationship with parents. It took me a long time after I grew up to learn how to own up, how to communicate, how to tell people how I feel about certain things. And uh, especially with um, the relationship, you know, with the husband, mm-hmm. it was like in the beginning when you get in a long time relationship, you're like, you know, everything has to be your way because this is how you were taught. Mm-hmm. And really it's really nice to learn how to tell them how you feel about it and listen to how they feel. Yeah. So I, I think like what you say about forming in the early childhood, mm-hmm. it's going to help them grow up of a more confident adult. And that 
you know, be strong and try to be the best. So, I, yes. Uh, my other question was, like, I've been reading about it in the past few days, and um, so my, my son, he just turned five, and he was not going to them, and he was never in preschool before by my choice. Uh, so I thought it would be really helpful for him to go to preschool for about six months, so he's ready for you know, like, uh, whatever, reading, math skills, communication, so social skills. What do you think, what's your approach on keeping kids at home or sending them to school? What's more important for them? Is it important? Does mm-hmm. it make a difference? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the three and four-year-old age range really develops the capacity for interactive faith, which means taught at two years will be parallel. Fiber. If there was another kid in the room, which we own them separately, but kind of watching each other, and then three and four year olds develop the ability to work with another idea and build a story. And three and four year olds are famous for pretend play, and they, they do it, they enjoy that so much. Um, and so there's a benefit for that kind of action with, with other kids. There's that social benefit of you say something, I say something, let's find a compromise, and let's say it like this, and yeah, it sounds great. Um, oftentimes, kids in that age range are working a lot of their emotional life out through their pretend play. So, you know, they may have people that either, you know, they're adults that the main teacher, they have all these ideas that they come up with, and it's not necessarily a literal translation of what they're feeling, but kids get so much benefit from um, unstructured free play time, especially at three and four. So I would even think the best way to prepare your child for kindergarten, which is going to be a little bit more expectation about sitting still and listening to what you're told and holding your pencil and, um, and focusing in that way, that the three and four year olds would be the best benefit a play environment. So I had parents say to me, you know, I want to put them in four and four years old to start learning this number and how to write letters. But the truth is there's no correlation if a child is ready that he becomes a smart child or that you can force a child that doesn't know how to want to it and there's some benefit to that. So I think kindergarten is plenty early to start with some fine order requests and, and the social environment of school. Um, but I think there's a benefit at age three and four to have interactive play with other kids. That could be in the form of play groups or you know play dates with other families. Um, school environments, me personally, I'm at four years old. I was spending so much time multitasking. I started a business and my son is home with me. But the truth is that I decided it was better every morning a week to go to daycare because they sang songs and played made art and played with each other and I certainly wasn't giving him that level of attention and then I had some time to myself and that was all for my family because I was actually more present in the afternoons when we came home for lunch and nap time and things like that. Well, it's the same thing for me. So I focus on my work in the morning and he goes to a, a little preschool three times a week, four to half hours per day. So I think it's important to your time to uh, learn how to sit still. That's you know. Mm-hmm. So you were saying it's not necessary for a child to go somewhere before it's out in the garden, is that right? Right. I don't think there's, they'll learn everything they need to know in kindergarten about writing, and the child already knows how to do that, and they enter kindergarten, it doesn't have any impact on how successful they are at the end of kindergarten. It could be that if your child's never really been interested in holding a pen writing letters, that um, during the process of that first year, they'll get much more familiar with that. So I don't feel like important with that. The there's first a lot of documents about it, and there, obviously, you know, there's so many different school approaches in the kindergarten and schools, and it is so stressful, because you feel like you want your child best, but then what is best? It doesn't mean that uh, the expensive pen school is going to teach your child everything that you know can be probably taught somewhere else in a public school. What do you think about that? You know, from, in my opinion, it comes down to the teacher, and the teacher really is the quality of what they learn and absorb. And um, I, my kids are in public schools, and my son did go to private schools. It's a hard decision, and you want best for your kids. Uh, and another thing to do when you're looking at school environments is the temperament of your child. One thing I talk to parents about is you, you learn the years of parenting your young child what his general response in stressful situations is. And that's really the temperament. That's actually something we have for our whole life. We get more mature and we manage it in different ways. Like to, have a, to react in a situation by getting really quiet and dry, big, you watch the room and you stay close to the people who are safe for you. Um, you have a child with called a slow to warm temperament. And my son is very much and he likes a lot of information ahead of time in new environments. He stays really close to me and it would take some additional time for him to feel comfortable. And I learned that over the years. And so when I think of setting him up for success and kind of being his number one fan, I think ahead about, oh, does he need to have information about this beforehand, or does he need more support to get that done? And I know the things that help him be successful. My daughter is completely different. Her personality is very kind of naturally confident, and she steps out, and she likes the in social environments at parties, like one of her favorite places to be. Um, and so I parent her a little bit differently. I know what, she's, what she can manage on her own, and I um, support her in, in different ways. So that's another, I knew that for my son, being shy and slow to warm that a small school environment was going to be important for him, so I kept him in a private setting for kindergarten and first grade. And then uh, when he had my daughter, the chosen public school, maybe it was getting expensive for the private school, and it's just the place we made that we went to public school. And, and we have some, some good teachers and some good teachers, but, but we stay involved in the learning, and the school environment isn't the only place that they learn. And we do things outside of that. We travel together, you know, um, so we try to have exposed to, my kids exposed to different environments. They're learning all the time, not just in school, because that's a lot to expect to know from public school. What would you say the percentage of, um, you know, how much the school is around, and how much, like, how much is the family at home? What's the percentage for that? Well, that's a question. Um, the home environment is always a normal standard by which your child compares everything else. So um, their experience at home, if they have a bad teacher, for example, uh, if their experience at home is generally close relationships with respectful communication, then they, they compare it back to that and they can say, oh, I'm just having a, a teacher that I'm having trouble relating to. Um, but I think the home life is definitely the, the majority of influence over your child. The school environment, definitely how challenges get managed and what your child is exposed to will, it will have different levels of impact. But if you have, you know, seen involved to get to know your teachers, volunteer at the school and you really kind of watch over your child then I've had great experiences and the teachers are always happy to have me being in class and you know they needed to help too. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so my last question is um, how do you balance your work with your family? What would be your advice to somebody 
So the reason I'm asking your, your, you this question is this. Uh, no matter what we do, if we uh, always judge change by society, other moms, by our parents, um, it's always something that we're doing wrong, you know? So like, if you work, you are the mom you want to your kids. You stay home because that's because you, you don't want to do anything. And uh, I think we always, I mean, not always, maybe not always, but I know I know a lot of friends who kind of feel the pressure to, you know, be in this um, frame, you know, that society is trying to build us, like to be that mom. Like, how do you make sure you mm -hmm. find enough time for your family, you spend a lot of time with your kids, but at the same time, you still have a successful business and, uh, you know, you pay for expenses, you bring money home, and uh, you found yourself as a person, you know, as a businesswoman beside being a mom? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's different for each person, and I think that what I have found in working with both professional moms who work at home and pursue a career and stay at home moms, um, it seems like you can experience more feeling balance when you have some focus in your life on your own personal wellness. And you have some focus in your life on creating meaningful relationships with other adults, like your husband or your wife, or maybe your, your family members or good friends. That it's really proven that women benefit so much from these tight friendships. That actually sustains us in many ways, and that not just a you know something that if you get around to it, you create if you really put some effort into being a good friend to people, and also inviting that kind of friendship into your life. And then the parent is the other of the areas that we always are, are working on, but it's all here separate from each other, right? So hopefully you guys a comfortable overlap. It. Um, you know, you can plan in time for yourself on personal wellness. And I, I really feel like for moms, if they're really like that brings you a sense of purpose, or if it's your fitness or pursuit of spiritual activity, meditation, church activities, prayer, um, whatever it might be, I just encourage women to have something and really identify what is the thing that brings you yeah, a purpose. And if it's motherhood, then you might have to work a little to find something that you like volunteering your kids' schools or having something that's a little bit expanded than just parenting your own children. Um, and so I think the balance is when you can feel like you have good quality relationships and you don't have to have a ton of them. If I have two or three really close girlfriends and my partner who um, I invite in, I feel kind of isolated. I have a good network and that's not a lot of people and that's, that's just what works for me personally. I would have, you know, extended acquaintances and take that, but uh, I feel like I'm less likely to feel um, insecure if I can maintain those things. So you hear those voices of people judging you or people telling you you should do it a different way. But I really feel like I take care of all of those things in my own life and I'm not as affected by other people's in it. And, and so that's kind of the balance I want to create with my clients. It's not just about learning about your kid's behavior and how to change it. It's really looking at, let's look at a piece of your life and see how that's working for you. Because like I mentioned before, when I suffered from depression, I felt like taking care of myself was just a luxury that I would get to someday. And the truth was it affected every other part of my life and I was suffering. And so as soon as I worked that into the equation, I started to be like a better mom and a better partner, and and I was I didn't realize how much benefit it would bring to the areas of my life because I thought, well, if I'm not taking care of myself, then everyone else is saying neglected, you know. And so that's been a life lesson for me. And I like to teach that to parents in that sense of that um, we identify in every way possible in your life. If you have four kids and they're all small, and, and you know maybe unrealistic that you have a professional life, but maybe you do. And we just try to work together to create a sense of balance because yeah, mom, when mom's happy, everyone's happy. To everybody again, this is Abby Wagner, and uh, there's a link to our website in the email you see. Uh, I hope everybody read it. I know that I received a lot of information that I wanted to hear. So I have, I get some help, and I hope everybody gets some help as well. Abby, thank you so much, and everybody will see you later. Thank you so much. That skill of emotional resilience is what creates people that really strive, like you were saying, to do the best. And I think that becomes kind of a giant quality of kids who get that secure attachment and, and optimal interaction. So I feel like there are times that I get to know and my advice becomes intuitive because they're not always a black and white. I mean, every situation, it's like, well, you could try this, you could do that, and I don't need to have a answer to how to get your kid to behave or do something. But if you focus on the relationship in certain ways that I teach parents, then you really build a, a repertoire of uh, coping skills that will best serve your child. And you waste difficult times as a parent and your kid will be struggles in their lives. And you just kind of want to be able to manage that out, you know, going down hell with emotion or, you know, self-harm. And uh, I think what you said, you know, the emotional connections they form in every childhood, because uh, it was not common to Soviet Union, you know, and uh, I never really had a really deep emotional contact relationship with parents. It took me a long time after I grew up to learn how to own up, how to communicate, how to tell people how I feel about certain things. And uh, especially with um, the relationship, you know, with husband, mm -hmm. it was like in the beginning when you get in a long-time relationship, you're like, you know, everything has to be your way because this is how you would talk. Mm -hmm. And really it's really nice to learn how to tell them how you feel about it and listen to how they feel. Yeah. So I, I think like what you say about forming in the early childhood, mm -hmm. it can help them grow up of a more of a confident adult and, uh, you know, be striving mm -hmm. and try to be the best. So I think, yes. Uh, my other question was, was, like, I've been reading about it in the past few days and um. So my, my son, he just turned five, and he was not going to and he was never in preschool before by my choice. Uh, so I thought it would be really helpful for him to go to a preschool for about six months, so he's ready for a kindergarten, you know, like, uh, whatever, reading, math skills, communication, so social skills. What do you think, what's your approach on keeping kids at home or sending them to school? What's more important for them? Is it important? Does mm -hmm. it make a difference? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the three and four-year-old age range really develops the capacity for interact. Which means taught at two years old to pair where if there was another kid in the room, they would own them separately, but kind of watching each other. And then three and four year olds develop ability to work with another idea and build a story. And three and four year olds are going to pretend play and they, they do it, they enjoy that so much. Um, 
And so there's a benefit for that kind of action with, with other kids. There's that social benefit of you say something, I say something, let's have a compromise, and let's say it like this, and yeah, sounds great. Um, oftentimes, kids in that age range are working a lot of their emotional life out through their pretend play. So, you know, they may have people that either, you know, they're involved with each other, or the main teacher, or they have all these ideas they come up with, and it's not necessarily a literal translation of what they're feeling, but kids get so much benefit from um, unstructured free play time, especially at three and four. So I would even think the best way to prepare your child for kindergarten, which is going to be a little bit more expectation about sitting still and listening to what you're told and holding your pencil and, um, and focusing in that way, that the three and four-year-olds would be the best benefit from a play environment. So I had parents say to me, you know, I want to put them in four and four years old to start learning this number and how to write letters. But the truth is there's no correlation if a child is that he becomes a smart child or that you can force a child that doesn't know how to want to it and there's some benefit to that. So I think kindergarten is plenty early to start with some of the final requests and, and the social environment of school. Um, but I think there's benefit at age 10 four to have interactive play with other kids. That could be in the form of play groups or, you know, play dates with other families, um, school environments. Me personally, I'm at four years old. I was spending so much time multitasking. I started a business and my son is home with me. But the truth is that I decided it was better three mornings a week to go to daycare because they sang songs and play, made art and played with each other. And I certainly wasn't giving him that level of attention. And then I had some time myself, and that was all for my family because I was actually more present in the afternoons when we came home for lunch and nap time. And it's an interesting thing for me. So I focus on my work in the morning, and he goes to a, a little pre three times of what's half hour is for a day. So I think it's a length of your time to uh, learn how to sit still. You know? mm-hmm. So you were saying it's not necessary for a child to go somewhere before it's out in the garden. Is that right? Right. I don't think there's the builder and everything they need to know and care about writing and the child already knows how to do that when they enter kindergarten. It doesn't have any impact on how successful they are at the end of kindergarten. It could be that if your child's never really been interested in holding a pen writing letters, that um, during the process of that first year, we'll get much more familiar with that. So I don't feel like important with that. There's the a year. lot of documents about it. And there, obviously, you know, there's so many different school approaches in the kindergarten and schools. And it is so stressful because you feel like you want your child best, but then what is best? It doesn't mean that uh, the expensive pencil is going to teach your child everything that you know can be probably taught somewhere else in a public school. What do you think about that? You know, from, in my opinion, it comes down to the teacher, and the teacher really is the quality of way learn and absorb. And um, I, my kids are in public schools, and my son did go to private schools. It's a hard decision, and you want best for your kids. Uh, and another thing to consider when you're looking at school environments is the temperament of your child. One thing I talk to parents about is you, you learn the years of parenting your young child what his general response in stressful situations is. And that's really temperament. That's just something we have for our whole life. We get more mature and we manage it in different ways. Like to, have, to react in a situation by getting really quiet and dry, big, you watch the room and you stay close to the people who are safe for you. Um, you have a child with called a slow to warm temperament. And my son is very much and he likes a lot of information ahead of time. In new environments, he stays really close to me and it would take some additional time for him to feel comfortable. And I learned that over the years. And so when I think of setting him up for success, and kind of being his number one fan, I think ahead about, oh, does he need to have information about this beforehand, or does he be more so to get that done? And I know that things help him be successful. My daughter is completely different. Her personality is very kind of naturally confident, and she steps out, and she likes being in social environments at parties. It's like one of her favorite places to be. Um, and so I parent her a little bit differently. I know what she, what she can manage on her own, and I um, support her in, in different ways. So that's another, I knew that for my son, being shy and slow to warm that a small school environment was going to be important for him, so kept him in a private setting for kindergarten and first grade. And then uh, when he had my daughter, we chose public school, maybe because it was getting expensive for the private school, and just with the made that we went to public school. And, and we had some, some good teachers and some other teachers, but we stay involved in them, and the school environment isn't the only place that they learn. And we do things outside of that. We travel together, you know. Um, so we try to have exposed to, my kids exposed to different environments. They're learning all the time, not just in school, because that's a lot to expect, you know, from public school. What would you say the percentage of, um, you know, how much the school is around, and how much, like, how much does it kind of do at home? What's the percentage for that? Well, that's a good question. Um, the home environment is always a normal standard by which your child compares everything else. So um, their experience at home, if they have a bad teacher, for example, uh, if their experience at home is generally close relationships with respectful communication, then they, they compare it back to that. And they can say, oh, that I was having a, a teacher that I'm having trouble relating to. Um, but I think the home life is definitely the, the majority of influence over your child. The school environment, definitely how challenges get managed and what your child's exposed to, will it will have different levels of impact. But if you have, you know, stay involved to get to know your teachers, volunteer at the school, and you really kind of watch over your child, then I've had great experiences, and the teachers are always happy to have me being in class, and, you know, they need to be to help too. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so my last question is, um, how do you balance your work with your family? What would be your advice to somebody? So the reason I'm asking you this question is this. Uh, no matter what we do, we always get changed by society, other moms, by our parents. Um, it's always something that we're doing wrong, you know? So, like, if you work, you are the mom one time with your kids. You stay home because that's because you don't want to do anything. And uh, I think we always... I mean, not always, maybe not always, but I know I know a lot of friends who kind of feel the pressure to, you know, be in this um, frame, you know, that society is trying to build us, like to be that mom. Like, how do you make sure you mm-hmm. find enough time for your family, you spend a lot of time with your kids, but at the same time, you still have a successful business, and, uh, you know, you pay for expenses, you bring money home, and uh, you found yourself as a person, you know, as a businesswoman, besides being a mom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I think it's different for each person, and I think that what I have found in working with both professional moms who work at home and pursue a, a career in stay-at-home moms, um, it seems like you're going to experience more healing balance when you have some focus in your life on your own personal wellness, and you have some focus in your life on creating meaningful relationships with other adults, it be your husband or your wife or maybe your, your other family members or good friends, that it's really proven that women benefit so much from these tight friendships, that actually sustains us in many ways, and that not just a, you know, something that if you get around to it, you create, if you really put some effort into being a good friend to people and also inviting that kind of friendship into your life. And then the parent is the other of the areas that we always are, are working on, but it's all here separate from each other, right? So hopefully you guys a comfortable overlap it. Um, you know, you can plan in time for yourself on personal wellness. And I, I really feel like for moms, if they're like that brings you a sense of purpose, or if it's your fitness or pursuit of spiritual activity, meditation, church activities, prayer, um, whatever it might be, I just encourage women to have something and really identify what is the thing that brings you a sense of purpose. And if it's motherhood, then you might have to work a little to find something that you might fall in your kids' schools or having something that's a little bit expanded than just parenting your own children. Um, and so I think the balance is when you feel like you have good quality relationships and you don't have to have a ton of them. If I have two or three really close girlfriends friends and my partner who um, I fight in, I feel kind of supported. I have a good network and that's not a lot of people and that's, that's just what works for me personally. I would have, you know, extended acquaintances and take that, but uh, I feel like I'm less likely to feel um, insecure if I can maintain those things. So you hear those voices of people judging you or people telling you you should do it a different way. But I really feel like I take care of all of those things in my own life and I'm not as affected by other people's in it. And, and so that's the family balance I want to create with my clients. It's not just about learning about your kid's behavior and how to change it. It's really looking at, let's look at a piece of your life and see how that's working for you. Because like I mentioned before, when I suffered from depression, I felt like taking care of myself was just a luxury that I would get to someday. And the truth was it affected every other part of my life and I was suffering. And so as soon as I worked that into the equation, I started to be like a better mom and a better partner, and and I was I didn't realize how much benefit it would bring to the areas of my life because I thought, well, if I'm not taking care of myself, then everyone else is getting neglected, you know. And so that's been a life lesson for me. And I like to teach that to parents in that sense of that um, we identify in whatever way possible in your life. If you have four kids and they're all small and, and you know maybe unrealistic that you have a professional life, but maybe you do. And we just try to work together to create a sense of balance yeah, because when mom, when mom's so happy, so everyone's happy. Thank you, um, everybody. Again, this is Abby Wagner, and uh, there's a link on our website in the email you see. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. I know that I received a lot of information that I wanted to hear. So I yeah. hope I get some help, and I hope everybody gets some help as well. And thank you so much, and everybody will see you later. Thank you so much. Involved in the learning, and the school environment isn't the only place that they learn. And we do things outside of that. We travel together, you know. Um, so we try to have exposed to my kids exposed to different environments. They're learning all the time, not just in school, because that's a lot to expect to know from other schools. What would you say the percentage of, um, you know, like how much the school is throughout, and how much, like, how much is kind of at home? What's the percentage for that? Well, that's a question. Um, the home environment is always a normal standard by which your child compares everything else. So um, their experience at home, if they have a bad teacher, for example, uh, if their experience at home is generally close relationships with respectful communication, then they, they compare it back to that and they can say, oh, that I was having a, a teacher that I am having trouble relating to. Um, but I think the home life is definitely the, the majority of influence over your child. The school environment, definitely how challenges get managed and what your child is exposed to will, it will have different levels of impact. But if you have, you know, seen involved to get to know your teachers, volunteer at the school, and you really kind of watch over your child, then I, I've had great experiences. And the teachers are always happy to have me being in class, and, and you know, they needed to the help too. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so my last question is, um, how do you balance your work with your family? What would be your advice to somebody? So the reason I'm asking you this question is this. Uh, no matter what we do, we are always get changed by society, other moms, by our parents. Um, it's always something that we're doing wrong, you know? So like if you work, you are the mom you want to understand with your kids. You stay home because that's because you, you don't want anything. And uh, I think we always, I mean, not always, maybe not always, but I know I have a lot of friends who kind of feel the pressure to, you know, be in this um, frame, you know, that society is trying to build us, like to be that mom. Like, how do you make sure you mm -hmm. find enough time for your family, you spend a lot of time with your kids, but at the same time, you still have a successful business, and, uh, you know, you pay for expenses, you bring money home, and uh, you found yourself as a person, you know, as a businesswoman, besides being a mom? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's different for each person, and I think that what I have found in working with both professional moms who work at home and pursue a, a career in stay-at-home moms, um, it seems like you're going to experience more healing balance when you have some focus in your life on your own personal wellness, and you have some focus in your life on creating meaningful relationships with other adults, be your husband or your wife or maybe your, your family members or good friends, that it's really proven that women benefit so much from these tight friendships that actually sustains us in many ways, and that not just a, you know, something that if you get around to it, you create, if you really put some effort into being a good friend to people and also inviting that kind of friendship into your life. And then the parent is the other of the areas that we always are, are working on, but it's all here separate from each other, right? So hopefully you guys a comfortable overlap it. Um, you know, you can plan in time for yourself on personal wellness. And I, I really feel like for moms, if they're really like that brings you a sense of purpose, or if it's your fitness or pursuit of spiritual activity, meditation, church activities, prayer, um, 
whatever it might be, I just encourage women to have something and really identify what is the thing that brings me as a purpose. And if it's motherhood, then you might have to work a little to find something that you like volunteering your kids' schools or helping something that's a little bit expanded than just parenting your own children. Um, and so I think the balance on men, you can feel like you have good quality relationships and you don't have to have a ton of them. If I have two or three really close girlfriends and my partner who um, I invite in, I feel kind of really I have a good network and that's not a lot of people and that's, that's just what works for me personally. I have a lot of, you know, extended acquaintances and take that, but uh, I feel like I'm less likely to feel um, insecure if I can maintain those things. So you hear those voices of people judging you or people telling you you should do it a different way. But I really feel like I can hear all of those things in my own life and I'm not as affected by other people's in it. And, and so that's kind of the family balance I want to create with my clients. It's not just about learning about your kids' behavior and how to change it. It's really looking at, let's look at all the pieces of your life and see how that's working for you. Because like I mentioned before, when I suffered from depression, I felt like taking care of myself was just a luxury that I would get to someday. And the truth was it affected every other part of my life and I was suffering. And so as soon as I worked that into the equation, I started to be like a better mom and a better partner, and and I was I didn't realize how much benefit it would bring to the areas of my life because I thought, well, if I'm not taking care of myself, then everyone else is getting neglected, you know. And so that's been a life lesson for me, and I like to teach that to parents in that sense of that um, we identify in every way possible in your life. If you have four kids and they're all small, and, and you know, maybe unrealistic that you have a professional life, but maybe you do. And we just try to work together to create a sense of balance because yeah, mom, when mom is happy, everyone's happy. To our people, um, everybody again, this is Abby Wagner, and uh, there's a link to our website in the email you see. Uh, I hope everybody read it. I know that I received a lot of information that I wanted to hear. So I have, I get some help, and I hope everybody gets some help as well. But thank you so much, and everybody will see you later. Thank you so much. But it's all here separate from each other, right? So hopefully you guys a comfortable overlap it. Um, you know, you can plan in time for yourself, your own personal wellness. And I, I really feel like for moms, if they're like that brings you a sense of purpose, or if it's your fitness or pursuit of spiritual activity, meditation, church activities, prayer, um, Whatever it might be, I just encourage women to have something and really identify what is the thing that brings me as a purpose. And if it's motherhood, then you might have to work a little to find something that you like volunteering your kids' schools or helping something that's a little bit expanded than just parenting your own children. Um, and so I think the balance on men, you can feel like you have good quality relationships and you don't have to have a ton of them. If I have two or three really close girlfriends and my partner who um, I invite in, I feel kind of really supported. I have a good network and that's not a lot of people and that's, that's just what works for me personally. I have a lot of you know, extended acquaintances and take that, but... Uh, I feel like I'm less likely to feel um, insecure if I can maintain those things. So you hear those voices of people judging you or people telling you you should do it a different way. But I really feel like I can hear all of those things in my own life, and I'm not as affected by other people's in it. And, and so that's kind of the family balance I want to create with my clients. It's not just about learning about your kids' behavior or how to change it. It's really looking at, let's look at all pieces of your life and see how that's working for you. Because like I mentioned before, when I suffered from depression, I felt like taking care of myself was just a luxury that I would get to someday. And the truth was it affected every other part of my life, and I was suffering. And so as soon as I worked that into the equation, I started to be like a better mom and a better partner, and and I was I didn't realize how much benefit it would bring to the areas of my life because I thought, well, if I'm not taking care of myself, then everyone else is getting neglected, you know. And so that's been a life lesson for me, and I like to teach that to parents in that sense of that um, we identify in every way possible in your life. If you have four kids and they're all small, and, and you know maybe unrealistic that you have a professional life, but maybe you do. And we just try to work together to create a sense of balance because yeah, mom, when mom is happy, everyone's happy. To our people, um, everybody again, this is Abby Wagner, and uh, there's a link to our website in the email you see. Uh, I hope everybody read it. I know that I received a lot of information that I wanted to hear. So I have, I get some help, and I hope everybody gets some help as well. But thank you so much, and everybody will see you later. Thank you so much. Like I mentioned before, when I suffered from depression, I felt like taking care of myself was just a luxury that I would get to someday. And the truth was it affected every other part of my life, and I was suffering. And so as soon as I worked that into the equation, I started to be like a better mom and a better partner. And, and I was I didn't realize how much benefit it would bring to the areas of my life because I thought, well, if I'm not taking care of myself, then everyone else is getting neglected, you know. And so that's been a life lesson for me, and I like to teach that to parents in that sense of that. that um, we identify in every way possible in your life. If you have four kids and they're all small and, and you know, maybe unrealistic that you have a professional life. But maybe you do. And we just try to work together to create a sense of balance. Because yeah, mom, when mom is happy, everyone's happy. <laughs> to our people. Um, everybody, again, this is Abby Wagner. And uh, there's a link to our website in the email you see. Uh, I hope everybody read it. I know that I received a lot of information that I wanted to hear. So I, have, I get some help, and I hope everybody gets some help as well. But thank you so much, and everybody will see you later. Thank you so much. And we just try to work together to create a sense of balance yeah, because when mom, when mom is happy, everyone's happy. To our people. Um, everybody, again, this is Abby Wagner, and uh, there's a link to our website in the email you see. Uh, I hope everybody read it. I know that I received a lot of information that I wanted to hear. So I, have, I get some help, and I hope everybody gets some help as well. But thank you so much, and everybody will see you later. Thank you so much. I hope everybody read it. I know that I received a lot of information that I wanted to hear. So I, have, I get some help, and I hope everybody gets some help as well. But thank you so much, and everybody will see you later. Thank you so much. That's as well. Thank you so much, and everybody will see you later. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.